Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about how most companies set dividends. Most companies set dividends very much like they, they decide how much to borrow. They look at what everybody else in the sector is doing and they try to do the same thing. So if everybody else is borrowing nothing, they borrow nothing. If everybody else is borrowing too much, they borrow too much. Similarly with dividend policy, they look at how much other companies pay in dividends and they decide how much to pay in dividends based on that practice. That might not strike you as a sensible way of running a business, but unfortunately it's a way dividend policy is set at most companies. So if you think about trying to set dividends based on your peer group, the first step of course is defining who your peer group is. And here you have to make some judgment calls. Whenever you decide that you're going to be like everybody else, you have to decide who those everybody else is in, in this particular analysis. It could be companies in your own sector. That makes sense, right? So if you're a software company, you're going to look at other software companies. Maybe there are differences in dividend policy across countries because of differences in tax treatment and history. Maybe you want to focus on just US software companies. And then you can add other criteria. Maybe you're a larger software company and maybe you feel that you're better compared to large software companies. So already you can see that when you think about determining dividend policy based on other companies, you have to make some judgment calls on who those other companies are going to be. So I'm going to use a very simple example to illustrate this process. I'm going to take a company called Hormel. It's a packaged food company. Its most famous product is Spam and trying to determine how much of whether it's paying the right amount in dividends by looking at its peer group. So to find its peer group, here's what I look for. I look for other packaged food companies in the US that had positive net income. You're saying, why positive net income? Because I think bringing in money losing companies is a little unfair because they don't pay dividends. They're not paying dividends because they're losing money. So money making companies, and I imposed a market cap restriction of being greater than a billion because there are a lot of very small packaged food companies that behave very differently with a sample of about 20 plus companies. These are my packaged food companies and what I'm going to try to do is look at Hormel's dividend policy relative to these other companies. Now to make a judgment on whether a company is paying too much or too little in dividends, you have to pick your poison. What kind of metric are you going to measure the dividends on? And there are three choices. First, you can divide dividends by market cap. It's a dividend deal and that number is going to give you the percentage return that investors get from dividends. You say, why would I want to do that? Because if your focus is on investors and the reason you pay dividends is to keep investors happy, the way value investors often judge how attractive a company is, is by looking at the dividend deal. It's that portion of the return that they believe can be counted on. So the higher the dividend deal, the more attractive the company. So you're, you can look at dividend deal. That's an external measure in the sense you're looking at investors and how they perceive you. You can go internal and say, can I afford to pay the dividends I can? And here the oldest proxy around is called the payout ratio. You look at the percentage of your net income that you pay out in dividends. Obviously, you'd like that number to be less than 100% because if you pay out 100%, you're paying all your earnings out and nothing is being reinvested. But you can see payout ratios of 20, 30, 40, 50%. So you can measure how much you pay in dividends as a percentage of net income. Now that number cannot be computed if you have a loss, which is not going to be a problem in our peer group because I constrain myself to looking at only money making companies. Finally, if you want to get more expensive, you could argue that maybe dividends have lost their cachet, that increasingly companies have moved to buybacks and that you should be looking at the total cash return, not just dividends, dividends plus buybacks and measured as a percentage, not of net income, but of a cash flow measure. And here, the simplest way to think about cash flows that are available to pay paid out is to compute your free cash load equity. For those of you who are a little confused, free cash load equity is your potential dividends, the cash left over after you've met every other need. Capital expenditures, working capital needs, debt payments, it's a cash left in the, in the till at the end of the year. So it's, I'm dividing cash return by potential cash return to get an aggregated and augmented payout ratio. So if you think about which one you will focus on, if your focus is on investors, you'll go with dividend yield. If your focus is internal, measuring sustainability, and you're an old fashioned company that pays out all of its cash flow, all of its cash return in dividends, and you're a pretty mature company, you don't have very much in, you know, net capex or working capital, you can look at the payout ratio. But more generally, you can also look at cash return as a person of free cash flow equity. I decided to compute all those metrics for my company. So basically I computed the yield, the payout ratio, the ca and already you can see there are some companies even in this peer group that don't pay dividends. Okay. Many of those companies, some, no, and a few of those companies return no cash. 
Okay? But B, these companies basically have computed the dividend yield, the payout ratio, and the cash return as a percent of free cash or equity. Notice that the cash return as a percent of free cash or equity can be greater than 100% if the company returned more than it had available. It can, be, it, it can actually be less than zero if your free cash or equity is negative, but I've constrained it to be, a, to be at the minimum zero. Now comes the step where you compare your company to what's typical for the sector. Now we've used this, this analysis before, so when you think about what's typical, you can go with the statistical average, the simple average, but the problem is outliers pull that out. You can go with the median, the middle of the distribution, or you can look at quartiles, the first quartile, the third quartile, you can look at deciles, you can look at the histogram to see where your company falls. So I decided to compare Hormel to the rest of the sector. Hormel's dividend yield is about 1.9%. The average for the sector is 1.56%, the median is 1.23%. It looks like Hormel is returning a little more cash than the typical company. It's closer to the third quartile than it is to the median. Okay? The payout ratio of 40.86% is much closer to the median. It's almost at the median, 37%. Um, the cash return as a percent of free cash or equity is higher than the median, the 38% exceeds. So overall, Hormel pays slightly more than the, than the industry average. It's close to the industry average in the payout ratio, but it's slightly more on the yield and the cash return. Now, don't jump to any conclusions yet, because in the fourth step, you need to control for differences. Differences in what? You could have 20 companies in a sector, but if you have high growth and low growth companies in that sector, you would expect high growth companies to pay out less in dividends than low growth companies. If you have companies with better projects, you'd expect them to pay out less in dividends if you have, you know, if you have better projects. And if you have more access to capital, you're a larger company, you have access to debt and equity, mar bond markets and stock markets, you pay more in dividends. And if you're a riskier company, you should pay less in dividends. So you want to check for growth you're going to check for project quality. You can measure that based on return on equity or some kind of return invested capital. You can look at measures of capital access. Maybe market cap is a good proxy for it. Larger companies have more access to capital and you can come up with your own proxy for risk, standard deviation beta. And perhaps if there are differences based on these fundamentals, you can see if your company can be explained using those differences. So I tried this for my, for my packaged food companies. I took my dividend yield and I, and I felt that dividend yield would be the proxy that Hormel would be most latched onto because they're very focused on the investors who like them because of their dividends. And I tried all the variables. I tried, uh, you know, risk and it, you know, growth and return on equity. And the variables that remained after all these tries were growth and risk. Higher growth companies had lower dividend yields and higher risk companies based on beta had, had lower dividend yields. You see the output from the regression. The R squared is not great, which means there's a lot of stuff that happens on dividend policy I cannot explain with fundamentals, which does not surprise me. The R squared is only 19%. What does that mean? It basically means there'll be a bigger range on your prediction. I plugged in the numbers for Hormel's growth rate, which is 9%, and Hormel's beta, which is 0.41 into that regression. I got a predicted dividend yield of 2%. At its actual dividend of 1.9%, Hormel looks like it's exactly where I'd expect it to be. So even though the dividend deal for Hormel was higher than the median, after you control for the higher growth and the lower risk, it looks like Hormel is where it should be. So the bottom line is when you think about relative assessment, you can compare to the sector and you can expand the sector. I could compare to all packaged food companies, not just the large ones, maybe global packaged food companies if I think that's appropriate. You can make those judgment calls and perhaps your assessment will change depending on who you compare to. In fact, I have a market-wide regression I run on dividend yield and dividend payout that I could plug Hormel into and come up with a predicted dividend yield given how the rest of the market is setting dividends. But I'm still staying true to the notion of relative assessment. So the bottom line is this. When you look at trying to decide whether your company is paying the right amount of dividends by comparing it to other companies in the sector, the judgment you're making is a narrow one. I'm not telling you Hormel is paying the right amount in dividends. I'm just saying given how other packaged food companies are paying dividends or setting dividends, Hormel looks like it's paying the right amount in dividends. It's entirely possible that the entire group is paying too much or too little in dividends, in which case your judgment is wrong on an intrinsic basis while being right on a relative basis. So keep that in mind as you go through this process, but it's actually an interesting way to double check whatever intrinsic analysis you've done on dividend policy to see if it's going to be easy for you to push for a change in that dividend policy.
Thank you very much for listening.